The use of ultrasound to guide spinal and epidural anesthesia is based upon the principle that if the ultrasound beam can penetrate the vertebral canal to provide an image of its contents, then likewise a spinal or epidural needle will also be able to enter the canal. A clear understanding of the anatomy of the lumbar vertebrae is important for the interpretation of ultrasound images. The vertebral canal can only be accessed through the interlaminar space. The boundaries of the interlaminar space are the spinous processes above and below and the lamina and articular processes on either side. Note that in the posterior anterior view, the interlaminar space lies in approximately the same transverse plane as the articular processes and the transverse processes. A low frequency curved array ultrasound probe is recommended for scanning the adult lumbar spine, particularly in obese patients. The structures of interest are located deep to the skin and low frequencies are necessary for adequate penetration. The wide field of view of a curved array facilitates recognition of the anatomy. The frequency of the probe should be set to the low range and the focus and depth also set appropriately. An initial depth of setting of at least 6 cm is usually required. The patient may be placed in either a sitting or lateral decubitus position. The ultrasound machine is positioned so that it is in the operator's line of sight. The goal is to achieve good ergonomics for scanning. The probe may be placed in either a longitudinal paramedian sagittal or transverse orientation. There are five common views that may be obtained and recognized when scanning the spine. Three of these are obtained with the probe in the longitudinal sagittal orientation. These are the transverse process view, the facet joint view, and the oblique view. Two more views can be obtained with the probe in transverse orientation. These are the spinous process view and the interspinous view. It is possible to go straight to acquiring the sagittal oblique view, but less experienced operators may find it easier to start by placing the probe just above the sacrum and lateral to the midline to acquire an image of the transverse processes. The transverse processes cast acoustic shadows over the psoas major muscle that resembles the fingers of a hand or the prongs of a trident. From this view, slide the probe medially to lie over the articular processes maintaining a sagittal orientation. The ultrasonographic view changes to show a continuous hyperechoic line of humps. These humps represent the facet joints between overlapping articular processes. At this point, the probe should not be slid any further, but instead tilted to angle the ultrasound beam towards the midline. This directs the beam onto the lamina and the paramedian interlaminar spaces to obtain the paramedian sagittal oblique view. On ultrasound, the sloping lamina have a sawtooth-like appearance. In between the saw teeth of the lamina, the limits of the vertebral canal are visible through the paramedian interlaminar spaces as two horizontal hyperechoic linear structures. The deeper structure is the anterior complex and represents the posterior aspect of the vertebral body, the posterior longitudinal ligament and anterior dura. Above that lies the hypoechoic intrathecal space containing cerebrospinal fluid and superficial to that the posterior complex comprising the posterior dura, epidural space and ligamentum flavum. The position of the probe may be fine-tuned by small sliding and tilting movements to optimize the view of the posterior and anterior complex. In the parasagittal oblique view, the probe can be slid in a caudad direction to identify the sacrum, which appears as a continuous hyperechoic line, and thus the L5 S1 space can also be identified.
The intervertebral spaces from L5, S1, up to L2, L3, can be counted up from this point. Each intervertebral space is centered on the screen, in turn, and their position marked on the patient's skin using a surgical skin marker. These marks serve as useful reference points when scanning in the transverse orientation later on. Note that if there is a large amount of gel on the skin, it should be wiped clear before marking the area. The probe is now turned into a transverse orientation to obtain the spinous process and interspinous views. If the probe is placed over a spinous process, the process and the adjacent lamina are recognizable by the acoustic shadow that they cast. This is the transverse spinous process view. Sliding the probe, either cephalad or caudad, will bring the beam into the interspinous and interlaminar space and give you the transverse interspinous view of the vertebral canal. The probe position may be fine-tuned by small sliding and tilting movements of the probe so as to improve the view of the vertebral canal. The anterior and posterior complexes, which delineate the boundaries of the vertebral canal, appear out of the acoustic shadow as linear hyperechoic structures. The articular processes and transverse processes are usually also visible in this view. Once the optimal interspinous view has been obtained, the midline is centered on the screen. The location of the neuraxial midline and the interlaminar space may now be marked on the skin where they correspond to the midpoint of the long and short sides of the probe, respectively. Each intervertebral space may be scanned and marked in the same fashion. Note that the posterior complex of ligamentum flavum, epidural space, and dura mater is usually less clearly visualized in the transverse view compared to the paramedian sagittal oblique view. Occasionally, it may not be visible at all. What is most important, however, is to visualize the anterior complex of posterior vertebral body and posterior longitudinal ligament, which will signify that the ultrasound beam is indeed penetrating the vertebral canal through the interlaminar window. The gel should now be cleaned off thoroughly. The lines marking the location of the neuraxial midline and the interlaminar space can be extended to intersect, which indicates the insertion point for the spinal or epidural needle. The operator should be aware that error in marking can occur, particularly from skin movement, and they should compensate accordingly. Careful skin preparation preserves the markings. The needle insertion points can also be marked by indenting the skin with the hub or cap of a needle. Local anesthetic is infiltrated and the block needle is inserted at the marked insertion point. If bone is encountered, this usually represents contact with the base of the spinous processes and small redirections in a cephalad direction are recommended. Note the use of a longer 120 millimeter needle in this individual. 
the need for a longer needle can be determined by measuring the depth to the vertebral canal using the electronic calipers on the ultrasound machine. A 22 gauge needle is sometimes preferable in obese patients as it is stiffer and less likely to deviate from its intended trajectory. Successful entry into the intrathecal space is signified by the usual endpoint of backflow of cerebrospinal fluid.